Thank you so much for the joy of being back with my uh, spiritual home in Dallas. This is where I nurtured my faith as a young seminarian many, many years ago. I used to sit way in the back row back there and listen to Dr. Johnson say, Lord, help me to begin to someday learn the Bible, just a portion like he knows it. And so it's an honor to be here. Today, my study for you is entitled The Promises of Providence. Uh, we're just going to jump right in and study. We begin by noting that the doctrine of providence is something that is a precious truth that is shared by people who have studied the Bible. They recognize that God is sovereign over the history of salvation and the events of humans' lives. Three words that are often associated with this great doctrine are God's preserving of all things, God's governing of all things, and God's concurring in all the secondary causes that happen in the world. It is his authority of, as God to govern. And this truth then brings many precious promises that we as believers should keep close to our hearts. As I begin today, I was uh, reminded of just an extraordinary providence I had yesterday. I thought the Lord must have given me this just for this moment. Now, Jeff is an eyewitness to this event. I'm coming down from having fellowships with the George Whitfield Society up in Oklahoma City, and I have to get a rental car because I'm gonna stay an extra day to meet with our board chairman of Westminster who lives over in that other big city called Fort Worth, okay? It's the small city of the Metroplex, I know. At any rate, I had to get a car, and so we, we couldn't find the place to pick up the car rental with the car return. We finally got there after 15 minutes of driving the wrong way, and the road was closed. So we had to go back and stop for directions, and there was no directions available at the spot. And then we said, let's go back and retrace our steps, and we all got on our GPSs to try to figure them out. And finally, we get right to the place, and my friend Frank was in the car driving, and I said, Frank, stop. If you go into this place, you're going to get inside and can't get out without puncturing your tires. So we stopped just in time. And of course, this is the exit over here. So we get my luggage out, and I wheel myself in, and I have to find my way to wherever the rights. I was Enterprise. I don't always use Enterprise, so I'm not trying to market any cars here. I use Hertz, too, and others, sometimes budget and dollar, whatever I need. But I was, finally got there, worked it out. Yeah, this is kind of the frustration of traveling, and I finally show up just at the right place. There's some other guy in front of me, just only two guys. It's a very empty spot, so sometimes you get in line and you wait with 100 people to get your rental car. Ah, so only two people, and I walk out, and the guy who comes up says, okay, I'm going to take care of both of you. And I didn't know who was in front of me. And uh, so he says, okay, uh, sir, what is your name to the man in front? He says, Olinger. I said, oh, I know someone named Olinger. That's fascinating. There must be more than one in the world. And he said, sir, what's your name? I said, Lilback. And Olinger turned around and said, Pete, what are you doing here? <laughs> I thought that was extraordinary. And so the young man, I'll call him Sam. So I'll guard his name, okay? Sam says, you two guys know each other? I said, yeah. I said, this is a divine providence. God brought us here just together. He said, well, what are you guys here for? And he said, well, I'm going to be going to this city. Well, I said, I'm coming to Dallas to preach about Jesus Christ. And this is a divine providence. The Lord wanted us here to bless you today. Are you a believer in Jesus? And he stopped and said, you know, two months ago, I put my life back in Jesus' hands, and I'm trying to begin a new walk with him. I said, Danny, you need to pray for this man. So we prayed for him right there. And we went out and got the car. And as he went to the car, I opened up and I pulled out the Gospel of John's that I carry with me. I think I got one in my pocket here. I'm going to give it out at lunch today, okay? So this is, this is the good news according to John. You know, I say, there's a lot of bad news in the world. Jeff, there's some really good news I want for you, okay? Give it. So I gave him one of these and I said, remember that God in his divine providence wanted to establish your faith by bringing two ministers of the gospel to you exactly the same moment to pray for your soul. We didn't plan this. We couldn't have planned it. If I had organized, I couldn't have pulled that off. But God was in charge of that moment to do that work. 
Isn't that wonderful? Sometimes he pulls back the veil of the mystery of his purposes and we get to see it. Most of the times we don't know. Sometimes we do. Providence is the doctrine that God is working out his will at all times in our lives to accomplish his purpose. So what are some of the truths that we can hear in Scripture that establish it? I'm going to just read lots of Scripture today and not exposit it and let the Word of God just coalesce as a theological medley of truths. And you might want to jot the references down if you want to study them. But let's begin by affirming then the doctrine of the sovereignty of God. Ephesians 1.11 says it so simply, God works all things after the counsel of his own will. Romans 8.28, all things work together for good to those that love God, to those that are called according to his purpose. Daniel chapter 4 and verse 35 says, all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, And he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? Psalm 103, 19 says, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Psalm 115, 3 says, our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. And Romans 11, 36, starting at verse 34, for who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory. These great truths that I have shared are summarized beautifully by 1 Chronicles 29, 11. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord. And you are exalted as head above all. I remember years ago, I had the opportunity uh, to be part of the Cedarville College Philosophy Club. And we welcomed a a scholar in by the name of Gordon Clark. I know Believer's Chapel knows Gordon Clark because I heard him speak here one time many, many years ago. So he was, was here. Well, he came to speak and it was wonderful to talk to a really trained philosopher who's also a very devout reformed Christian. And we were talking. And the man who was going to be introducing him and leading in worship at the chapel service the next day said, uh, Dr. Clark, I have to pick the hymn uh, for the chapel. And I was wondering if you would tell me what would the title of your lecture be? And with a very wry smile, Dr. Clark said, it's called Shooting Craps. <laughs> and the, the poor young guy... Now, now, how do you choose a, a, a good hymn for that? So those of us that were in that small group couldn't wait until hear what hymn he was going to have. And he says, let's all rise to sing. And when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. <laughs> I thought that's the greatest joke I'd ever heard that just came out of nowhere. Okay. God is sovereign. The Proverbs say even the casting of the lot is in the hand of God. Is that your faith? That's out of your Bible. It's an amazing truth. The sovereignty of God is not canceled out by human events, and human responsibility is established, not removed by God's sovereignty. My father, who is a math professor and a very humble evangelical believer, one time sat down with me and said, Pete, I've been scratching my head about the fact you know, there are three different types of geometries, and they all teach different things about parallel lines, and they're all mathematical. He said, you studied Euclid, and you know the fifth postulate of Euclid is that a point off a line, only one parallel line can be drawn through it. We can't prove it, but that is the, that's an axiom. We hold it as a presupposition. You all learned that, or you failed it in geometry, right? <laughs> okay. Then there's another kind called Lobachevskian and another kind Ramanian geometry. And if you're not a mathematician or the son of a mathematician, you never heard those words probably. But one of them says that parallel lines meet an infinite number of times. And another one says parallel lines meet at least once. Now, how is that possible? They sound contradictory. And my dad said, you know, you need to realize we use all three of them practically. One we use to build roads, one we use to do subatomic particle analysis, and another one we use to do spaceflight. We do all of them. 
That's a mystery. How can they all be true? They are not contradictions. They are tensions. Uh, our wonderful theologian J.I. Packer in his book, Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God, uses the word antinomy. Two things that seem to be contradictory, but both are necessary for the system of truth we're operating to be able to function. They are tensions, but they're real. And so in this sense, we need to understand that God's providence does not cancel out human responsibility. And we're going to try to establish that in different ways. But let me just give you this one simple illustration used all the way back since the Second Helvetic Confession, which is one of the great Reformation confessions uh, written by Heinrich Bullinger, the successor of Zwingli in Zurich. He pointed out, do you remember the story of Paul's shipwreck? Okay, Paul said, listen, the Spirit of God has spoken and none of us are going to perish. Isn't that wonderful? A promise. And then all the men begin to scheme out how they're going to get off the ship. And Paul says, stop. If you get off the ship, you're going to die. Now, wait a second. You, you're not going to die and you are going to die. How is it possible? Because human responsibility was not canceled, but was established. Inferior causes are not canceled out by God's determinate decree and purpose. They come together. God is sovereign. We are responsible. They are both truths that cannot be escaped. When Packer speaks of it, he says that it's like light being a particle and a wave at the same time. Quantum mechanics cannot explain it, but both are true. God is sovereign. We are responsible, and we cannot cancel them out. Do you remember how Jesus prays in the Gospel of Matthew? Lord, you have blinded the minds of the wise and prudent, and you've revealed these things unto babe. Even so, it is your will, Father. No one knows the Father except the Son and to whomever the Son reveals Him. Wow, that's sovereignty. But then what does He say? Immediately after that, the same message. Come unto Me, all of you who are tired and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take My yoke upon you and learn of Me, for My burden is light, and you shall find rest unto your souls. Sovereignty and responsibility are two sides of the same coin of the divine currency that operates the universe. God is a God of sovereign providence that establishes human responsibility. If you feel this is a mystery, then that's good because it is. As Job 11, 7 to 9 puts it, can you find out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limit of the Almighty? It is higher than heaven. What can you do? Deeper than Sheol. What can you know? Its measures longer than the earth and broader than the sea. These are great mysteries. But as Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, the secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but the things that He's revealed unto us belong unto us and to our sons, that His covenant may be established. God has told us these things, and therefore we hold them true. So then, if we've summarized very rapidly this marvelous mystery of God's sovereign providence, then what are some of the promises that we can claim from this? Okay. Let me begin by just saying that the first one, I want you to take this to the bank now. Personal confidence in trying times. Might we be in trying times? Do you ever feel like the world is running amok every place you turn? Do you need to have confidence and not be overcome by fear? Well, then listen to your Savior in Matthew chapter 10. Have no fear. So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my father who is in heaven. Isn't that wonderful? Jesus said, don't be afraid. You have a sovereign God. 
The Bible says he knows every day of your life before there was one of them. They're all written in this book in Psalm 139. He knows the end from the beginning, Isaiah says. Wouldn't you like to go to the stock market with that knowledge? I would even gamble on the World Series if I knew that. The end from the beginning is established by our God. Personal confidence in trying times. That's one of the promises of providence for you. Let's take another one. How about this? International upheavals. Any international upheavals on your news cast recently? Well, listen, Galatians 4, 4. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Time is not outside of God's sovereign purpose. He has set the times. In fact, Paul will say this wonderful message at Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17 and verse 26. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. We don't fully understand what God is doing at any moment, but he says the boundaries and times of empires are within God's hand. It's uh, fascinating that one of the great Puritan uh, writers in his body of divinity by the name of Watson, Thomas Watson, said, when you are a young person and you walk into a blacksmith shop, you look at all of these tools. Some are crooked, some are straight, some are sharp, some are blunt, some are big, some are small, and you say, this is chaotic. What is going on here? It makes no sense. And But to a blacksmith, every one of them does a precise function for the beautiful wrought iron that he's producing. And so that image is that we don't understand how God uses the tools of things like the Ukraine and Russia or COVID or runaway inflation, but God has a purpose. I had the opportunity just to share in our prayer meeting before we gathered as the question was asked, what's going on at the seminary? I said, well, let me tell you some good news that came out of the bad news. My faculty together about three years ago said, you know, we just don't want to go this online route. We want to have a residential program. So that's right. I'm no prophet. This proves that I said, in my lifetime, we'll never see an online seminary at Westminster. Well, lo and behold, along came COVID, and the governor shut down every school. We could not operate by law. And all of a sudden, I was glad we had started a year earlier to do a little bit of online education, because in a week's time, we were able to turn it around. And as a result of that, some special friends said, if Westminster is going to go online, let's do it really well. And can I tell you one of the wonderful blessings of COVID? We now have 700 for credit students around the world that would never have been able to attend Westminster. And not only that, because of that, we've realized that we need to begin to move in multiple languages. And the next year, we will have programs that will be operating in Korean, Mandarin, Spanish, and Arabic. That's a direct result of COVID. That's God's doing good out of tough stuff. The international disease, the pandemic, has brought about international global ministry that none of us had the ability to dream about or believe in. God does amazing things, and that's, that's the promise. In fact, not only is there personal confidence, not only is there a confidence as we look at the international struggles, but even the rise and fall of rulers are in God's hand. This is a promise. And in the book of Daniel, we read in verse 20 of the story of Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, the companions of Daniel. We know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? By their Babylonian names. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. Our God is a God who is at work with tyrants like Nebuchadnezzar to accomplish his purpose. He still is at work even in the midst of the chaos that we see in this world. Indeed, it was even true in persecution. In that same book of Daniel, you'll remember the story. As these young uh, Hebrew believers are facing uh, death, because they will not bow down in idolatry to the tyrant of religion and government named Nebuchadnezzar. 
We read, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. That is about bowing down to your shrine. If this be so, that is, you're going to throw us into the fiery furnace. Our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, how about that? But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. We hear about martyrs for the faith, people who may die even this day because of their witness for Jesus Christ. They have the courage to say, God can deliver me. But if he chooses not to, we will honor our Lord. Why? Because they've come to understand the moment that their life is snuffed out, their eyes open to the King of kings and Lord of lords and the glory of heaven itself. They translate from this world of sorrow and tears into the glory of an eternity that nothing can cancel out. All of this then, these promises of providence and persecution, rising and falling of kingdoms, boundaries of nations and their epochs, even our own confidence in the time of fear is vouchsafed because of the redemption that has been accomplished in the sovereign purposes of God through the cross. Redemption accomplished. We think of the promises of prophecy of the coming of the Messiah. Every one of those promises were promises of providence fulfilled. The promises of your predestination are coupled with the promises of providence. The promises of typology of all the sacrifices, the images, the rites and rituals of Israel. All of those were vouchsafing a certain future that God's providence would bring to pass. We see it in the provision of the ram in the thicket when Abraham was ready to take his son named Laughter on Mount Moriah. On the mountain of the Lord it shall be provided. That is providence. We see it in Genesis 50, 20, when Joseph looks at his brothers and say, I know you wanted to do this for evil, but God meant it for the good, for the saving of many lives. And so we find it in Acts chapter 2, verse 23, as Peter stands on the day of Pentecost to preach, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God's plan was not foiled by the cross. God's plan was fulfilled through the cross. And yet the men who did it were responsible for their wickedness. Luke twenty two twenty two. this is our Lord speaking. Indeed, the Son of Man will go as it has been determined. But woe to that man who betrays him. God is sovereign even over Judas's betrayal of the Savior. God is in charge. We are responsible. Acts 4.27 says, For truly in the city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant your servants to continue to speak your word with boldness. As Christians, when we look at the cross, we look at the most heinous, most ugly and unjust means of death and torture as it was applied to anyone, and especially to the creator of the universe who is incarnate. And yet we don't see it as ugly. We sing, lift high the cross. I look to the cross of Christ beneath the shadow of the cross. God has turned that ugliness into beauty by his sovereign providential purpose to accomplish redemption and to apply it to his people. Redemption is applied. God is the God of Romans 3.26. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. What was utterly unjust has brought about our justification. So the providence of God that we're speaking about is beautifully summarized in the idea of our union with Christ. Jesus, who went to the cross, 
was entirely within the determinate counsel and plan of God, sent at the right time to accomplish God's redemption. And yet, are we not chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world? Are we not crucified with Christ? Are we not buried with Christ? Are we not raised up with Christ? Are we not seated with Christ in heavenly places? Are we not united to him? The life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We are united. With, our lives are hidden with God in Christ, as Paul says in Colossians. The Heidelberg Catechism, the Reformed Catechism that has been such a wonderful gift through the years, asks in its first question, what is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, it answers, but belong with body and soul, both in life and death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Christian, who do you belong to? You're not your own. You've been bought with a price. We're all wrestling with identity today. What is your identity? Your identity is Christian. You are Jesus Christ's. You are in Him. He has fully paid for all my sins with His precious blood and has set me free from all the power of the devil. He also preserves me in such a way that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, all things must work together for my salvation. Therefore, by His Holy Spirit, He also assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready from now on to live for Him. Providence and soteriology, providence and union with Christ, providence and our salvation are inextricably, inseparably joined in God's purposes. The God who saves you is the God who keeps you. Faithful is he who has begun a good work in you that will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Paul celebrates this at the conclusion of Romans chapter 8. Relish again these marvelous words that belong to you as one united to Christ. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that who is raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No! In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Indeed, no one can pluck you out of my hand and the Father who gave you to me is greater than all, and no one can pluck you out of our hands. We hold on to you. You cannot be separated from the love of God in Christ, no matter what this world may throw at you. Yes? There are times we might say with Habakkuk, as he writes at the beginning of his prophecy, the burden that he received in a vision, How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not hear or cry out to you, Violence! But you do not save. Why do you make me see iniquity? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife is ongoing and conflict abounds. Do you ever feel like Habakkuk? That's why you need to remember these promises of providence. Because if you have them, when you think about the Ukraine, what do you say? Acts 17, 26, and he has determined in allotted periods in the boundaries of the nations according to his purpose. When you hear about global warming, it used to be global cooling when I was in college. Now it's global warming. I, I don't know how we got, we went right through the ice age and I missed it, I guess. <laughs> but as Genesis 8:22 says, while the earth remains seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. God's providence reaches to the very planet that we live on. 
and politics. When you hear more fighting about politics and you've had enough and you don't know who to vote for and you want to fight with your pastor for what he said in his sermon or you want to fight with your pastor because of what he didn't say in his sermon. You need to read Psalm 75, verses 6 and 5. Do not lift up your horn against heaven or speak with an outstretched neck. For exaltation comes neither from east nor west nor out of the desert, but it is God who judges. He brings down one and exalts another. That doesn't mean we're not responsible, remember? We're supposed to vote right. But we know that God's purpose will not be thwarted by Republicans or Democrats. As was said so well long ago, the kingdom of God does not come on Air Force One. It comes through the gospel of Jesus Christ, which we all have. That's what we're talking about. And so this is where the promise of providence is so wonderful. The personal guidance in our own lives. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, every Christian needs to memorize that and meditate on it and quote it often. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct your paths or make your path straight. He will keep you in the straight and narrow. Meditate often on Psalm 139. Do you remember Psalm 139? He knows when you rise up, when you lay down. He knows what you're going to say before there's a word on your tongue. I say, Lord, I wish you'd shut my mouth if you know I was going to say that. Okay, but he lets me get to say some bad stuff. So I hope I'm not in too much trouble for my preaching today. So Psalm 139, I'd love to preach that, but I don't have time to do that today. How about provision? Well, Nehemiah 9, 21, for 40 years you sustained them in the wilderness. They lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out nor did their feet become swollen. Then he brought out Israel with silver and gold, according to Psalm 105, verse 37, and there was none among his tribes who stumbled. Deuteronomy 8, verses 3 and 4, and he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Your clothing did not wear out on you, and your foot did not swell these 40 years We could meditate on that for a long while, but I'm reminded of the stories that have been told about the siege of La Rochelle. Perhaps you've never studied that part of Reformation history, but it was the city right on the western edge of France. It was an island city that was the last holdout of the Huguenots that were utterly being destroyed by Louis XIV, the king, when the Edict of Nantes was set aside. And a siege is a time where people are going to starve to death. And again, this uh, Puritan theologian mentions, he said, sometimes the Lord allows his people to suffer, but he allows them to see also his special providences to meet their need. And so in the midst of that time of suffering where there was no way to get to land, no way to get ships to them because they were, they were surrounded by Richelieu, the cardinal, a cardinal so great that it was said he made his king Uh, first in all of Europe and second in France. He kind of ran the show. And this was his scheme, destroy the Huguenots and consolidate your power. Well, the story is told that while the people were being faithful to Christ, not abandoning their faith, as they were beginning to hunger, a whole school of fish that had never been seen in anyone's history came by that island just at that time and they were able to be fed. That allowed them to survive until finally the siege was lifted. Amazing stories like that in God's time. In these early Reformed confessions, one of the things that we'll find is God's use of even difficult things like a man losing all of his donkeys. You know, the donkeys, maybe you heard about the... uh, ship that went down with 4,000 cars on it coming from Europe. Mike Black told me about that just uh, the other day. That just happened about two months ago. Well, that, was, that hurts a lot of auto dealers. So you can be sure of that. Well, imagine if you lost your whole herd of donkeys. That's your whole livelihood. And so you send your young son Saul out to look for them. And he's looking all over and he can't find them. But he doesn't find them. But you know what he finds? 
the prophet he was supposed to meet who says, you're going to be the king of Israel. We need to understand that in the circumstances of our lives, when they're wrong turns, difficulties, heartaches, God may be taking us to just the place we need to be so that he might bring us what we need to have. I'd like to read an extended passage from the Institutes by Calvin. This is book one, chapter 17, paragraph six. He says this, the use of the doctrine of providence. How do we use it? Well, he says that basically the fact that a special providence watches over the safety of believers is attested by a vast number of the clearest promises. Cast thy burden upon the Lord and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. Casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He that toucheth you toucheth the apple of mine eye. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. Can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget. Yet will I not forget thee? Nay, the chief aim of the historical books of Scripture, Calvin goes on to say, is to show that the ways of the saints are so carefully guarded by the Lord as to prevent them even from dashing their foot against a stone. Therefore, as we a little ago justly exploded the opinion of those who feign a universal providence, which does not condescend to make special care of every creature, so it is the highest moment that we should especially recognize this care toward ourselves. Hence our Savior, after declaring that even a sparrow falls not to the ground without the will of his Father, immediately takes the application that being more valuable than many sparrows, we ought to consider that God provides more carefully for us. And he goes on. So as we begin to wrap up, what shall we say? Stop worrying. Stop worrying. Did not our Lord say to us in Matthew chapter 6, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you'll put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. I'm reminded of another story. This one is from Spurgeon, again about La Rochelle. There was a particular lady who was quite successful, quite prosperous, who had plenteous food and sustenance in her home. And people were beginning to starve everywhere. And she began to give away all that she had. She began to give it away until finally the day came she had nothing left for her own family. She was trusting the Lord. And with great hunger and humility, she went to her sister, who was not so generous, and said, could you kindly provide for me? And she said, well, you better trust in your God who's taken care of you or not giving you anything. How would you like to hear that from your sister? She went home to her house, and then she opened the door. There were two big bushels of wheat. And she came back to tell her sister, the Lord has provided. Thank you for your prayers. <laughs> Isn't that a great story? I can't tell you how God will provide for you but you have the promise of the Lord of the universe who says, seek my kingdom. And what you need, he knows you need it before you ask of him. 
He knows, more, he knows how many hairs are on your head. He knows how many days are in your life. He knows what's going to happen to you tomorrow. He's already planned for it. Be bold to live for Christ. We of all people should have the courage to go about our business for Christ. There's a great story that B.B. Warfield told about the Western frontier. Remember in the lawless West? Uh, that's that uh, time when all kinds of uh, wild things happened and there was no protection. And so a marshal was sent out to protect it. And as the marshal was walking along, another man who was with him noticed he seemed to be utterly fearless as he walked by through the streets at night, realizing anything could happen. It's totally an, uh, an outlaw context. And after they passed each other for the second time at night, he said, what is the chief end of man? The other man said, to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And he said, I knew you were a catechism man. You know the providence of God, don't you? Isn't it wonderful that these are our promises? Why don't we claim them and live them? The boldness and courage that comes to those who know their God is greater than anything we face. And yes, to follow the Lord can have hard times, but they're within God's plan for us, and therefore we're not afraid. We know God is working through all these things. And this is what we find as we think about Joseph. Remember in Genesis 45, Verses 5 through 8, And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God he has made me the father to Pharaoh and the Lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. You meant it for evil, he'll say, verse 20 of chapter 50, but God meant it for good. And so as we conclude our time together today, I want to encourage you to say, Lord, how do I take these promises of providence and live them out? How do I believe that not a hair can fall from my head unless it's working together for my salvation? There are setbacks, there are illnesses, there are heartaches, there are disappointments. God works through all of them. They're not outside of his purpose. We are always responsible. God does not diminish our responsibility, but God overrules all things for his purpose. And that purpose rests upon you. And when you feel in the middle of these things, you say, but so many things are unjust. There's a wonderful section at the end of Martin Luther's Bondage of the Will. If you've ever read that, you might go back and read it again. At the very end, he says, yes, the world is filled with injustices, but because God has predestined all things, the day will come when justice will be given, when he brings the final judgment, because all will be given the opportunity and the painful duty of standing before his throne of righteousness and justice will be meted out. And that is why the scriptures say, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. Justice is to come. In God's providence, he may not let us see the justice that we feel is due us, but God will see to it that justice is done because that too is part of his providence. He will make all things new, and someday he will bring about a perfect uh, standard of righteousness toward all that's happened in history. So where do we finish? I, I'd like to propose we finish where we started. I don't know if you're going to be dropping a rental car off at DFW Airport, but you might get delayed in traffic instead of grumbling. Say, so you know what? Maybe God has a purpose in this. In fact, there's a more wonderful story than mine. There was a, a wonderful Christian missionary who had been serving, uh, he was not from America, he was from another country, and so he was able to get to Vietnam in the midst of the war. And so as he went there to see what missionary work was done, he was traveling along uh, with a missionary in an old clunky Jeep. And as they were traveling along the roads, 
the missionary talked to the uh, visiting missionary and said, I just want you to know you're now entering the most dangerous part of Vietnam. And he thought to himself, why didn't he wait and say, you just left the most dangerous part of Vietnam? <laughs> so now he's beginning to worry. They're driving along in this old Jeep, and as they're going along, all of a sudden the Jeep just clunks out. And they say, okay, let's go to work. So they're not mechanics, they're trying to get this Jeep going, and they can't get it to run. And he says, I can't believe it. I am now stranded in the most dangerous part in Vietnam with a bunch of monkeys that can't fix this Jeep. What am I doing? And then as they're wrestling, trying to start over the background, they hear the coming of a vehicle, and there is a brand new white Jeep coming over the horizon. And they said, praise God, the Lord has heard our prayer, and they're waving their hands, stop, we need help. And that Jeep just goes right around and it zooms right by. And they said, oh no, we're left with no help, no ability to fix the car in the most dangerous part of Vietnam. Nobody is going to help us. And they said, all we can do is keep working. So they work, and all of a sudden the thing starts. So, oh, thank you, Lord. And so they start driving, and about five minutes later, as they're driving along, they come to a place and they see a brand new white Jeep blown to smithereens, dead bodies on the road. And they realized a Viet Cong war party had come just by and they decimated that vehicle. And they realized that would have been them. And so that missionary said, I made a determination. Never again will I grumble when I'm late for a meeting because of traffic, because a train just won't get out of my way and I have to wait here, or because something came up that forced me to be late. God works all things together for our good. He has a purpose. And so in these hard times, in these uncertainties, cherish these promises of providence given by grace for you. They're yours. Why not use them? Why not claim them? And seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all that you have need of will be added unto you. Well, Let's pray, and if maybe we have a few minutes, I'll try to take a question or two. Lord, would you bless this teaching of your word? Should there be any uh, insights that you would allow to touch the hearts of these who've gathered? I rejoice. Lord, you said you'd be the teacher of your people. We've heard your word. Would you please speak through it? Build up your people. Advance your kingdom. And we pray it all through Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay, do we have time for a few questions? It's about 20 after, or should we stop? Okay, we need to stop.